大家早上好，欢迎收看《财新辩论》。今天的特别的节目，我们在柬埔寨金边录制，讨论的题目是“现金如何不再为王”。Hello, everyone. Welcome to Thai Xin Debate in Nam Pen. Today,、uh, we are going to discuss how to dethrone cash as a king. I'm Li Xin, the managing director of Thai Xin Global. Southeast Asia is on the verge of the、uh, digital boom. The numbers are stunning. For the more than 600 million people in this region, more than a third are smartphone users, and more than a quarter have subscription to broadband、uh, uh, have subscription to broadband services. The high penetration rate is growing in double digit, but at the same time, we have very low application of many of the services, the digital services, including, let's say, e-commerce, which accounts for only three percent of the retail sales here, compared to more than 14 percent in U.S. and China market. And so much of the transaction is still taking place in cash. So why is there the mismatch? How to close the gap? And just imagine the force that will be unleashed when we close this gap. So today we have distinguished panelists here joining us to discuss this issue and tell us why <coughs> and how.、Uh, let me introduce my panelists here. So first of all, let's say Dr. Ying Chani, the president and the managing director. Of、uh, the group managing director of Cambodia's Aklida Bank. Thank you. And Mr. Tim Murphy, the、uh, general counsel and chief franchise officer of Mastercard. And Nick Nash, the group president.、Uh, Nick Nash, the group president <laughs> of what formerly known as Garena and now C Group. Thank you. Yes. And Rahul Singhal from PayPal, general manager of PayPal Southeast Asia. Let's first start hearing from Dr. Ying Chani, who has a fascinating personal story from a、uh, labored kid in, under Khmer Rouge, and now the founder and also the founder, also the president of the largest bank in Cambodia. So,、uh, Dr. Ying Chani, how do you see the mismatch, and how do we change that here? So, thank you,、um, uh, Mr. Li Xin. I think the sub the subject is a、uh, inspire me a lot, no? so because、uh, Cambodia, even、uh, we are. Look into the, compared with the other country in the region in ASEAN, yes, especially we are, we are like uh, the, the uh, not the not the not the mature in terms of financial、uh, system. We are, but we are not、uh, leave behind. We are fast in such a way in terms of technology. You know, we, so the, I compare with the with the country、uh, with the facility facility with the landline. We start with the technology where we have mobile. So we, this is in such a way we are fast. So look into the mismatch. You say that uh, 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 compared to the United States in and also in the uh, the mature uh, country, uh, the, the ASEAN on the penetration only three、mm-hmm. percent. But、uh, this is、uh, there are a lots of、uh, key、uh, barrier into this. So one is the customer education. And secondly, when we talk about the e-commerce, we look into the regulation in place. So talking about regulation in place, we also not talk just one, but one ministry. We talk about、uh, a few involved ministry that need to coordinate, need to work together, need to agree that certain regulation related to e-commerce need to、uh, to be just assign one ministry to、uh, to look into that. In, let me give you in case of Cambodia as a. Uh, Cambodia. So when we talk about e-commerce regulation, we talk about、uh, Ministry of Commerce. We talk about the National Bank of Cambodia, and we talk about the Ministry of, of Interior. As,、uh, when look into the, there is a draft law already in place, but、uh, to my understanding, it's from 2015. So it takes time. So this is、uh, first customer education. Second is the e-commerce、uh, law and regulation, and the third one is the.、Uh, Related to the availability of the support network, but this is not a big issue. Like I said, we we、uh, we join in this uh, network uh, later, but we move faster. I you we used to travel to the other country, let in the U.S., in Japan, in、uh, Europe. It, it, you know, in terms of、uh, network, do you we pay in Cambodia? Lots of、uh, place. I mean,、uh, many places such as a hotel, restaurant, it's、uh, free. So the support the network is uh, it's uh, available here. The technology is even much more available. So this is the、uh, specific key barrier why e-commerce 
why e-payment, why uh, like a payment via card facility move uh, slow? Because uh, key, the key one like uh, customer education, the regulation. Why we need regulation when, when we uh, continue to provide these services? There is no, no authority in Cambodia say that this is no regulation, you should not do it yet. No, no, no such way. But we think in terms of uh, this dispute, when the dispute comes, and then we think that all oh, the regulation is very important. Mm. Because, and then uh, we want the regulation that can help solve the issue quickly, not, not a matter of like, so far we said let's wait until 45 days. So we, we want within a week, at least, no? if, uh, if uh, not within a day, at, at least uh, within a week, not three months. So this is uh, my, my point related to why it moves uh, slow in our region. Mm -hmm. Very okay. important point on regulation, and we'll come back on that. Mm -hmm. But before that, can you give us a sense of the huge penetration rate of mobile phone mm -hmm. here and the missed opportunity or the potential of the opportunity here? Because yesterday, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Prime Minister Hansen mentioned there are uh, the, the, the uh, phone ownership is like 120% of the population here. Yeah, that's correct, because like I said, uh, we, we join late, but we move fast. Mm -hmm. Like a uh, number of uh, mobile phone, uh, as our prime minister indicated yesterday, 125%. So one, like one person have more than uh, one mobile phone. So this is on the uh, penetration. And then look into the smartphone also, because the availability plus the price, no, affordable price, it's not talking about from 700 to 1,000 US dollar, but we talk about 150 to 200 US dollar, they can have a large capacity already. So the penetration is very high. Um, and, and like a two-third, not, not, not one-third, like you said, like a one-third in, uh, in the other world, but in Cambodia, because it's a two-third of the people who own the smartphone. Two-thirds. Yeah, yeah. Very okay. impressive. Mm -hmm. And now let's switch to uh, Tim. So Tim, you have more than 17 years experience on payment. So uh, tell me how you see the mismatch here and how would you um, address that? Compared so um, it's, a, it's a great question. In, in some ways, cash still remains king, as, the, as, uh, as we've said. 85% of the transactions in the world today are in cash. Um, we know that cash is difficult for consumers in terms of security, uh, in terms of forcing people to wait in line for transactions. We know it's difficult for societies. It's, um, uh, it uh, promotes um, the gray economy, and it's a challenge from a from government standpoint for uh, tax collection. If we uh, increase any country's uh, percentage of electronic payments by 1% relative to PCE, we know we can help accelerate GDP growth, GDP growth, uh, by somewhere between a third and a half of a percentage point. So the value to be unleashed is substantial. Um, I, I think the challenge ahead of us is one that requires a whole variety of solutions. Um, this is a, uh, a challenge that will be addressed by card payments, by mobile payments. It will be addressed by banks and by fintech providers. It will be addressed by uh, the public and the private sector working together. Uh, and in our view, there's three things that are essential. The first is you have to recognize that one of the reasons for the mismatch that you've talked about uh, is because electronic payments, distinct from having access to the internet, uh, is a different kind of transaction. Governments want to know who is conducting payments around the world. There are fundamental requirements in every country worldwide on anti-money laundering, on KYC, uh, know your customer. That means that identity, formal identity for consumers is a critical part of enabling uh, the world beyond cash and <coughs> electronic payments. And systems like that lack in many places. And so formal identity is a key part of the, uh, of the dethroning cash uh, as king. We're seeing really interesting progress in India, Nigeria, and other places on very major efforts to, to provide more people around the world with a formal identity. Um, the second thing we've got to do is recognize that in order to displace cash, we need every human being on the planet to have access to a secure transaction account. We need that account to be usable in many places, and we need to uh, educate consumers, as Dr. Chani said, about the benefits of electronic payments. All three of those things are required. 
um, and they will take work across all elements of the sector to, um, to, uh, to drive progress. Financial institutions have a huge role to play, so do mobile money operators, so do e-commerce giants. Um, and one of the critical things we need to do together is, is make sure that small merchants, small enterprises around the world can accept ele uh, electronic payments. So there's quite a bit of work to do. Very interesting. Uh, thanks for mentioning the financial inc inclusion, and we'll come back to that. And now, Nick. So, Nick, your company just changed its name this very week from Garena to uh, SEA Group, from C to C Group, and you are one of the leading internet companies here, if, uh, the, one of the most highly valued internet company in this region. So tell us, first of all, why do you change the name? It's a great question, and thank you so much for, for organizing this panel. It's wonderful to be here with a number of friends and many, many teachers in the audience that have given us so much over the years. Uh, Greeno was founded back in 2009 with a very specific mission, which was to democratize technology for the true middle class of, of what we call Greater Southeast Asia, which is ASEAN and Taiwan combined together. And our very first business was in digital media and entertainment, and that's flourished. It's become a very significant, in fact, the number one by market share business in its category. And then about two years ago, we launched a second business in financial services, a payments business, again, to democratize payments for this region. And then about a year and a half ago, we launched yet another business uh, in e-commerce called Shopee. And Shopee is now the largest e-commerce business in what we call Greater Southeast Asia in terms of the orders per day. And AirPay is one of the very largest in fintech. And we felt that we needed a brand that wasn't just the brand of our first business, but a brand that captured all of what we want to do for consumers. And so we thought long and hard. And, picked the simplest, humblest name we could find, which is C, because it stands for Southeast Asia, and it also is the one unifying geographic element of this entire region. Something like 90% of our population here lives on an island or near the shoreline. The sea is part of our lives every day. So we, we felt great about that. Very smart. And let's come back to our question. How do you and how does C Group see the mismatch here? And how do you address that? We've been talking about this for a while. We, we are are frustrated in some ways by the tremendous mismatch between digitally connected consumers and digitally disconnected paying consumers. And advertising alone will never support great internet business models here. We have three very specific views that we want to share with the group. One is that solving the cash problem will be essential to this. We notice in every one of our markets, even our more affluent markets like Taiwan, that cash is an important part of the equation. And we've stumbled upon, I, I would hesitate to say we've invented, because others have had similar successes, on a model we call the reverse ATM, where we enable hundreds of thousands of locations, in our case about 150,000 locations, as top-up points for moms and dads, as regular middle-class families, to top up money into a wallet. And that leads to our second view, which is that I think an incredibly important part of where payments will evolve in Southeast Asia is towards prepaid debit accounts, which may or may not be linked to a bank account. Uh, today in Southeast Asia, about half of our population, almost 300 million people, don't even have a checking account, let alone a fintech sort of snazzy wallet. And that's going to be a very interesting concept that will gradually shrink over time but actually hundreds of millions of people may initially adopt more of a prepaid relationship through a mobile wallet. And our third observation is that we find that there really is an opportunity for local and regional champions to be successful. There are phenomenal global businesses like PayPal and MasterCard that have a role to play here, but we'd be disappointed if there weren't a few local champions as well. But the missing ingredient to do that is deregulation. And the reason we say that is it is probably impossible in some of our countries here for a local startup, an ASEAN startup, to get an e-money license. And for all sorts of reasons we can discuss later in the panel, but liberalizing that, giving our local companies a chance to compete on a level playing field in this region, I think is crucial for us to have a national and a global leader in this area. Thank you, thank you. And we'll talk about the level playing field and the <coughs> global champion in a minute. So Raul, now turn to you. You, uh, you are responsible for expanding PayPal in the Southeast Asia region. So how do you see the shift in this region? Hi, good morning. First of all, uh, great. thank you so much for you know, having me on this panel. It's my great privilege, and I'm really excited to be on this panel. Uh, I've been associated with financial inclusion, displacing cash for the last 18 years, and pretty much most of it in this part of the world. So I'm not giving you my CV, but just trying to uh, establish the relevance uh, to this particular context. So extremely excited to talk about this with my fellow panelists. Uh, I think it's an important issue. I think we can all agree cash is dirty, cash is dangerous, and cash is expensive. You know, I think. Uh, it's, it's incumbent upon us, the industry players, both global and local, to try and displace it. It has huge benefits 
for the society, for the economy, uh, for GDP growth, as uh, Timothy mentioned. Um, my vantage point on this area is a little different from uh, what uh, Nick and uh, uh, Timothy mentioned. Uh, they were kind of focused a little bit on the consumer side, getting consumers to adopt financial services. Whereas, whereas what we have been doing at PayPal and what I have been uh, and my teams have been involved is enabling the small merchants, the MSMEs, the entrepreneurs, the micro enterprises to go online and start earning a livelihood. And I think we've, uh, we've seen tremendous progress in that area. Uh, when we talk about financial inclusion, you know, the general definition is typically about getting people who are unbanked a basic financial uh, instrument so that they can do basic transactions. I think we've taken a different, bit, slightly different uh, stance to this, which is enabling the, the underprivileged, the underserved, and allowing them to connect to the global economy and uh, start doing trade, basic trade. Uh, and one of my favorite examples which underpins this is, uh, is in Philippines, a lady called Janine, uh, one of our customers. She's a freelancer. She does web design services. And uh, she used to be a nurse and used to find it very difficult to meet, uh, make her meets, uh, ends meet. Uh, then she discovered that she's a very good content writer and a blog writer. And uh, somebody told her, why don't you go online? So there are a lot of freelance platforms like Upwork, freelancer.com, Facebook, where she could put, find clients. And PayPal was there to, you know, to bridge the missing link of payments. So she was able to then start doing content work for a global audience and start mm -hmm. earning a livelihood. She was able to quit her job and now employs four people and you know, runs a fairly big enterprise and earns 10 times that what she was enterprising. So we, this is an example of financial inclusion. This is an example of uh, dethroning cash. Uh, and you know, that, that's kind of been a big, big focus area on, uh, on enabling the MSMEs. And this Janine is one example. There are about 200,000 such examples that I can talk about. Uh, mm -hmm. Southeast Asia now has close to about 3.5 million freelancers. Freelancers is a broad definition of anybody who's given up their uh, regular job and doing work on their own from the comfort of their homes. So all they need is a computer and a fast internet connection. And uh, you know, that, that has been growing quite rapidly. And you know, we've been enabling that. A little bit on the consumer side, uh, uh, alluding to some of the points which uh, the fellow panelists made around, uh, uh, around getting people, the, especially the underbanked and the underserved, basic access to financial services. And I think we've struggled with that for the last eight, nine years. Uh, you know, M-Pesa in Kenya is always touted as a great example, 40% of GDP now is going through M-Pesa. They've done a phenomenal job in getting people into basic, getting basic financial services. And I think there are more than 20 mobile operators who've tried this in this part of the world uh, with limited success, because they've limited the use cases specifically to airtime top-up and P2P. And uh, it's very difficult to explain to a customer why do you need to get a wallet, store cash in it, leaving it idle for a future use case. And I think that's where uh, Nick's company has done a marvelous job in trying to open it up and say we make it more ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. And as again, uh, credit to where credit is due with MasterCard, you know, they have done a phenomenal job in, uh, in getting the prepaid rails out there. So a lot of the wallets, which were closed loop wallets, which could only be used within a certain ecosystem, mm -hmm. have now opened up. And uh, you know, let's take an example of uh, True Money in, uh, in Thailand. They were essentially a closed loop wallet or AirPay in Thailand. Uh, and now connected on the MasterCard rails. It, it gives you ubiquity. So you know, when you say cash is king, I think cash is king, but the, <coughs> but the use case is King Kong, just to sound corny. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. So uh, if we can step back a little bit, and you mentioned the underbanked and also the underprivileged who didn't have uh, formal access to, to financial service. So who are the, really the customers here, and how to compare them to the customers elsewhere? Do they, are they different? So Tim, what's your take on that? So um, the, I, I think your points about um, there are common use cases, there are common needs around the world. Um, and um, so there's probably more similarities than there are differences to answer your question, but I'd point to maybe two things. One is um, our Center for Inclusive Growth has done some work on uh, digital indexes and trying to understand um, how different countries rate <coughs> on access to digital services. What we find again and again is that um, while so-called transaction factors, things like access to financial services, a basic account, or for a small merchant, um, uh, an ability to transact online, uh, is important. At the end of the day, access to the internet, access to mobile services are really fundamental drivers. So this part of the world, uh, relative to places like the United States or China, there are still gaps and those need to be addressed. And I think um, policy focused in those spaces will be helpful to drive the digital economy and ultimately helpful to 
um, deliver for all of us a world beyond cash. That's one point. Uh, the other, which I think is, uh, I, I don't want to say unique to uh, the ASEAN countries, but relevant here, is at least with respect to physical goods. So I'm not talking about digital services. Um, this is a market where consumers want to touch and feel what they've bought before they pay. Um, and we need to make sure that digital payment solutions uh, are designed for that use case. In other words, um, there has to be local variation and local innovation to make sure that the particular cultural needs are being addressed. And it's why, for example, I think the kind of mobile-based P2P solutions that are based on prepaid, where a good can be delivered digitally and then the payment made, once the consumer has inspected it, are quite interesting. It's why we're very interested within our own <coughs> ecosystem on QR-based payments, because you can print a QR code on a receipt and make a card-based payment in a very low-cost and inexpensive way um, uh, online. So there are differences, and I think one of the benefits of of open innovation and effective policy, and I agree on licensing in particular. The more people we can bring into these ecosystems, the more innovation we can have and open competition, you will get innovations that deliver against those, those particular consumer needs and thereby move all of us uh, closer to, to, to a true digitally enabled economy. And just now, Raul mentioned there is lack of compelling user cases to move the customers online, and, and your company has been doing very well on that. So how do you solve the problem and, and build up more compelling cases and to move them to the digital finance? I think Raul's absolutely right. In the last 10 years, that's been a challenge. But the good news is in the last 12 months, we're really making progress. And our, our study of other emerging markets suggests that there are really, at the end of the day, three use cases that get linked to e-wallets very well. Uh, the best one is daily e-commerce. Uh, Alibaba, Taobao, and Alipay is a great example in China. The second is games, entertainment, media. And the third is actually chat, not because you're paying the person you're chatting with, but because of red packets and gifting and whatnot. And in China, you've seen that manifest with Alipay and, of course, Tenpay. In Southeast Asia, we're seeing it happen in a couple of different businesses. We're fortunate to be the beneficiary of some of that, but others are as well. And now that the use cases are firmly in place, I think you're going to see a, a snowballing of people adopting e-wallets. In our own business, we find that our e-wallet transaction flows are growing about 30% every quarter, not just every year. And that's an exciting place to be. That's great. That's fantastic. And where we'll do you agree? <coughs> Uh, no, I agree, and I think your original question was uh, differences between consumers in US, China, and, and this part of the world. I think consumers are the same very much. They all want the same thing, uh, access to seamless services which don't have a lot of friction, uh, you know, ubiquitous use cases, ability to use it everywhere. Uh, I think the key difference uh, has been in the ecosystem and the infrastructure, something which we should discuss a little more during the panel. Uh, you know, I'll take an example of Venmo in the US, which is a PayPal company. It's, you download the app, you can set it up within a minute, uh, you can link your bank accounts, and you are basically good to go. Similar thing with, uh, with WeChat in, in China and other, other similar payment services. Come here, and Nick would agree with this. It is you need to be almost Albert Einstein to connect your bank account to an app, right? Absolutely. There are the number of steps you have to go through, and I think Thailand Prompe has done a great job in trying to simplify that, uh, the government-led initiative. But the, the experience is not that great, so you know the level of comprehension the customer needs to have to basically just set up their basic services is extremely high. And on top of that, you add the layer of complexity of KYC, face-to-face -face KYC, and transaction limits, and essentially the barrier to get started is so high. So to me, that is, is a very, very big fundamental problem in trying to reduce the barrier, because once you've onboarded somebody and once they've done the first, second transaction, getting engagement is easy. Uh, but I see from my vantage point the biggest barrier, at least on the consumer side, has been uh, uh, you know, going through these obstacles and making it simpler and simpler. But progress is being made. Um, I think technology is a great level of uh, a little more on the MSME and the entrepreneur side. I think there we've seen tremendous progress. As I said, uh, you know, three and a half million uh, freelancers are for a population of 650 million. It's quite incredible, you know, close to almost half a percent of all people are freelancers. And if you just see the entrepreneurs who are doing global trade, our estimate is between six, six and a half million dollars. And my hope is that goes to $20 million. And again, that's where we've been focused on, trying to enable them to get online quickly and start accepting payments globally. Thank you. And also, let's uh, move on to talk about the infrastructure mm -hmm. that is uh, necessary in this region to move that. And uh, Dr. In China, you mentioned about the regulation, you mentioned about the consumer 
uh, uh, education as well. What other infrastructure you think is needed here? You know, in in Cambodia perspective, we, we uh, bank microfinance start, try to add uh, infrastructure, physical branch and offices very close to the customer, and then we move to electronic uh, infrastructure, ATM machine, point of sale. And the customer still think that, oh, even you have many branch and offices, we have uh, accessible via ATM machine point of sale, it's not enough. And then the provider, bank, financial, microfinance institution try to add additional infrastructure. We use uh, mobile phone banks, uh, payment, uh, like a payment uh, uh, company that provide payment solution via mobile phone facility. So the infrastructure I'm talking, I'll talk about a regulatory framework is one already, and then uh, internet provider. In Cambodia, again, as I like want to highlight, in our case, the access to internet in Cambodia is very high and very convenient and very competitive in terms of pricing. You know? So that's why a provider try to compete among, among one another so that customer can use it much more convenient and most of the time it's free. So it support, uh, it support uh, 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 the player in the financial industry like bank, financial institution and other company to uh, develop the, the facility uh, to support uh, uh, their customer. One, one uh, uh, not, not a concern, not an issue, but when we start to introduce a mobile app, which is very convenient for the customer to register, and then there is a question from the customer, how come, because when they travel to the branch and offices, there's a lot of questions. We ask them questions, we ask them to provide proof, like ID, many things, but via the app, registration via the mobile app, it's so convenient and we require ID. Also the same question asked, but the, question, the answer filled by them. They, fill, uh, they, fill, they provide the answer, they provide the ID, and the registration done via the mobile application. And then the question from the customer, how come it's so convenient? And then they have doubt. <laughs> they need to come to the office to prove that now I'm your customer already. Yeah, but, uh, but uh, so the technology, uh, the infrastructure, I mean, the, we establish the, everything so that to, to have facilitation on uh, like customer regi registration. So the customer have that because of so convenient, so secure. They need to go to the bank to tell that I'm your customer, something like that. But uh, we, uh, because this is a long, uh, it's traditional, it's also cultural also. So we uh, need to convince them that this is uh, the way it should be. Another example, a thing, uh, a proof provide electronically, you know, for example, like the receipt. They say, no, this is the receipt. We explain to them it's the electronically receipt, but you need to sign yeah, to make sure that I'm, I'm paid to prove that I'm, I'm done my transaction, or you need to stamp. So this is also part of behavior of the customer. We need to change also. So again, I'm back to the infrastructure I'm uh, you want to, to find out. I think that this is the, the, the internet uh, uh, provider, the Wi-Fi facility, the, the, uh, and the support uh, technology availability uh, to, to make sure that uh, those, uh, uh, we talk about uh, uh, e-payment, digital, we talk about uh, destroying uh, cash as a king, but uh, you raised about security. I see that the customer still uh, think in terms of uh, diversification. I have card, I have, uh, I have um, a mobile phone. Uh, it's like function as a wallet, and then they need, uh, they need cash. So uh, branch and offices, ATM network, it seems like function as a, as a choice. Mm. They have card. If the card doesn't work, what should I do? I use uh, more. I use my wallet. If the wallet doesn't work, I need to go to the branch. I need to go to the ATM machine. Yeah. So, so that, multiple yeah. choices. Yeah, multiple choice. Yeah. yeah, that's yeah. Right. And the, so, the trust so again, I, I, I don't want to to see uh, other key to replace cash. I like to see the other come in complement to, to the, the 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 like the system we have, the payment solution we have, so that function as a choice. Mm -hmm. They can choose. Yeah, it's not, if the other facility come to replace cash as a, another key, so if we create the other issue later on, we need to find a solution to replace the new facility instead of cash again. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
Thank you. Very important point. So we don't install a new king, but we have multiple choices and multiple solutions that customers feel comfortable to use. Yeah, and so, I think Dr. Chinese comments also, I think, highlight two, two things. One is, I know we'll come back to it, but good policy is so important in every country around the world to, to advance the electronic payment agenda. Flexible KYC uh, regimes uh, to help address some of the pain points that we've talked about are very important, and that's something that this part of the world, I think, can look, can look hard at. Um, but also, when you talk about um, consumers, and you've talked uh, today about consumer education, uh, we find again and again that um, it's actually quite counterintuitive. If, you are, if you're addressing a consumer who is fully embedded in a cash economy, the, the thing that doesn't work is, uh, is to give them an electronic payment solution and say, go do this. You have to... Uh, you have to talk about the benefits of electronic payments, but you also have to assure them that they have ready access to cash. In other words, cash is the very beginning of the electronic payments journey, and the only way you will get people who are very reluctant to enter this space um, is, to, is to assure them that you can get, uh, they can get access to cash at any time so that um, they will then keep a bit of savings in an electronic account. And that's why the multi-channel that Dr. Chani was talking about I think is very important. Thank you. Uh, if we can divert the uh, conversation a little bit to the technical side and see uh, what, are the, what are the most important technologies you think that will come and change it and move people to uh, not cashless, now we know that it will be multiple solutions, to a uh, uh, less cash-based digital economy. And let's start with Raul. Sure. <clears throat> uh, from my point of view, three things. You know. Mm -hmm. A lot of the incumbent players, both local and global, have done a pretty good job in creating a decent user experience for the consumer on uh, the merchant side. Uh, I think three things which uh, will really spur this out. The first one is KYC, you know, simplifying KYC, making it electronic, uh, and not really requiring the customer to walk up to a store, and using both internal and external data uh, to do KYC, from my point of view, is important to get scale. Uh, the second thing is the onboarding process on the merchant side, on the seller side. Um, I think it takes a very, very long time today in this ecosystem to get scalable merchant acquisition. Uh, and uh, so I think that needs, to go, that needs to change. I think I, I look forward to technologies which can essentially create scalable uh, acquisition on the merchant side uh, and you know, essentially scale hundreds of thousands on a daily basis, like what we are seeing in China, US, etc. Uh, and the third thing I think which is very pertinent to this part of the world is the integration with social. You know, we all have a preset notion of how consumers will pay. They'll download an app, they'll log in, they'll... But that's kind of being fundamentally challenged in a lot of, a lot of places. Thailand, 50% of e-commerce now, as per estimates, is act happening on Facebook pages. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing merchants who used to have websites, shopping carts, uh, and were selling and investing in traditional ways of SEO, SEM are abandoning that and essentially just creating a Facebook page, soliciting consumers there and then completing the transaction offline on Messenger or WhatsApp. And so the payment infrastructure which integrates with social channels uh, more tightly, I think, will, will be the third innovation that I'm looking forward to. Very important, social. And Nick, do you have anything to add? I, I agree with what Rahul has said. And I think I'd add one thing, which is we've talked a lot about in this conversation the consumer. And that's absolutely fundamental. But we think, as, as I think Rahul has articulated, the small business side of that is equally essential. You can't have e-commerce without a small business person on the other end as a merchant. And if I unpack that onion just one more layer, you can't have a small business without working capital. And we think that the potential to use payment networks, not just to push dollars or bot or dong one way, but the other way is quite interesting. And what I mean by that is using these networks to do small business lending. And at a deeper level, using the transaction data that comes out of e-commerce or games or whatnot to do selective and thoughtful underwriting, even in the absence of a formal credit application. We, we've started piloting this, and it's very, very early days. But what we find is that if you have a year's worth of transaction history for a small SME, perhaps selling 20 or 30 packages a day, that's actually good enough to get the underwriting to a point where you can have NPLs below 0.7%. That's pretty interesting. It's almost like Netflix telling you what movie you should watch tonight. We're proactively telling a merchant, you know what, if you just had a few hundred extra dollars, you'd have a bit more inventory and a few less stockouts, and your business would be better. So we're intrigued by this concept of alternative forms of lending. 
lending is still lending, but different channels, and most important, alternative credit scoring technologies that don't rely on a traditional FICO score or going to Moody's for a rating, but instead use transaction data to make a better decision. Alternative credit system, basically. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, I want to add, like, you talk about technology, so I look into a specific country, there are many providers. We always want to, this is my, my know-how, I develop myself, I work alone, you know, so it won't work. So it, they can have the integrated technology that the player in the in specific country work together so that it can link with the global, with the, at least the regional and the global. If you still say that this is my own technology, my copyright, it won't work. No? So we need to work together in, at the country base. At least <coughs> you, you, we talk about like uh, access to public integ like integration so that if one develops, the other can join uh, to avoid like uh, additional cost, unnecessary, unnecessary cost, and also to avoid additional like uh, research and development. If one uh, conduct the research or develop, develop the platform where Everyone can join as one. So this we need like an integrated uh, technology. Yes, of course we always need uh, like to uh, depend on the uh, provider, include the inter uh, internet, uh, uh, avail uh, like internet, uh, the availability of the internet reliable. No, that's because when talking about it, we cannot think in terms of uh, out uh, like a uh, disconnected with reliable internet that support uh, the integrated uh, technology. You know? So this is the key point. I'd yeah. like to add to what yeah. Dr. Chani has just said, which is exactly right. Mm -hmm. If you think about what is a bank, really, a bank acquires CASA, mm -hmm. it acquires short-term liabilities, and it lends them out on the asset side with some mismatch of duration to get a spread. And that's a perfectly logical and very timed thousand-year-old business model. But if you go to a traditional bank, even some of the best microfinance banks, like the one that Dr. Chani has created, the idea of giving a $20 loan to someone, business or otherwise, for 20 days is so uneconomical from a cost income perspective, it simply isn't done. But on the other side, if you go to a technology company, they can do that, but they don't have the balance sheet. So Dr. Chani is exactly right. We've got to find ways to have better commercial partnerships between wholesale banks, pools of capital, liquidity, and those that can, in a very fine, almost salami slice sort of way, divide that liquidity into where it's most needed. It's, at the end of the day, a distribution problem more than it is a financing problem. That's right. But I'll add to that, Nick, uh, and this is, you know, you're both of you are exactly right. The payment company is probably in the best position to do micro lending because they have transaction history, they have, they've already underwritten the customer, and they, more importantly, they have visibility on future sales of the merchant. And, but they don't have the balance sheet, a lot of them. Uh, what the challenge I've found is that uh, you partner with the bank, but the banks are still required to go through the, regular, the full burden of KYC. So you need wet signatures, etc. So you can do a $20 loan, but the cost of getting a wet signature yes. is probably $100. I think that's where a lot of the innovation needs to happen, uh, working with, with the government agencies and the regulators. It's the accumulation of all of those non-tariff, non-intended barriers that gives us a phrase we use inside of our company, which is that Southeast Asia is the cheapest place in the world to be a rich person <laughs> and the most expensive place in the world to be a poor person. And that's very true. The other point, no? so you see, what we have, we have made uh, one mistake already related to the point of sale. You know, you know and we talk about merchant, no? the, the difficulty of the merchant. Each merchant, they have, uh, if they deal with uh, more than one bank, they have uh, like um, more than one uh, point of sale, no? three, five, and up to 10, 10 point of sale, and they have limited spaces. So we talk about like uh, QR code. No? So to avoid a repeated mistake, we should have only one QR code for all. I mean, uh, for all, all <coughs> player, all bank, just. I, I heard the initiative from like Master Visa, and also want to uh, look uh, into this uh, what, one code applicable for all. I, I think that's, that's the, the thing we should look into you know, to avoid mistake when we, everyone on uh, its own uh, like a network, own point of sale, and then difficult for the merchant. So just one QR code and then accessible to all, mm. all like, uh, I mean, a player in that. No? Yeah. I, I, yeah. Well, we have to yeah. get that right. Yeah. And I, I do yeah. think your earlier comment about yeah. interoperable yeah. systems that, that yeah. leverage common technologies is hugely important to drive this. Just to come back to the, to the 
question about uh, government. Um, I think the, uh, we've already talked about KYC and simplifying KYC. I think that's one place that um, policymakers can help address uh, the issue. Uh, I think public-private partnerships uh, working at how we um, uh, match capital to some of the, to, to some of the, I completely agree, the incredible power that comes out of the, these payment systems in terms of doing alternative underwriting. We still struggle globally, actually, with making that real at scale. So that's an untapped ish, issue for all of us. Um, I, I just, just to pull on government, I do think government has another huge role here, and you mentioned it a little bit, and it's that government by far is, in most countries, is the largest economic actor. If government systematically moves to a place where it will receive funds electronically, so e-government solutions, if it systematically moves to places where it will disperse funds electronically and not via cash, whether that's social benefits, payroll, or other things, across whatever means you choose, you will see dramatic shifts towards uh, a, a cashless society in those economies. So it is both about a good regulatory regime, KYC. Uh, it is about thinking differently about, um, about credit underwriting. But then it's government as an economic actor pushing this more aggressively. We're seeing some wonderful progress in Eastern Europe and some countries in Latin America that are adopting leading principles in this space. G governments can learn from one another on these things. Very interesting. So government as the government as first actor, user. Or, first user. Yeah. 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 So but we talk about government's role as to provide the level playing field or as the first user. Another part of that is the protection of the consumer. Yeah. And we talk about the alternative credit system and all this and the convenience of having more financial services online. But will that jeopardize the protection, the security of people's digital footprint and the uh, the, the, the financial information? No, I, I think, uh, you know, Li Xin, your, your comment is absolutely right. If you think about government says service providers and producers are public goods, clearly privacy, protection, security across the world of payments and people's savings is absolutely sacrosanct. And the horrifying scenarios when a family in the Philippines or in Indonesia with a gross worth of a few hundred dollars and a net worth that may even be negative is, is somehow subject to a fraudulent set of transactions, which, which do happen. And that's an absolutely horrifying scenario that both the private sector and the public sector need to manage. So we are completely aligned with that. And uh, needless to say, the origins of KYC in many ways are around fraud minimization and, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and anti-avoidance. But I think there's a deeper truth, which is governments operate, number one, through a principle of, of compassion towards their people for protection, but they also operate with a, a theory of how the world should be. And one of the perhaps mistaken theories that's prevalent right now is that everyone looks north to countries like Japan and China and say, ah, Japan has a JCB and China has a China Union Pay. We've got to get one of those for our country as well. And the number of countries in Southeast Asia that are all trying to think about, should we have a national SOE payments company, is quite high. And that may be a little flat-footed in some ways because it leads it to become more of a rentier sort of business and frankly, not a business that democratizes payments. I think the question that we'd love governments to be debating once they've come to the right landing place in security and protection is really a more fundamental question, which is, should payments be free? Not just free to consumers, but subject to you know, covering costs and variable expenses, should payments even be free for small businesses? And in fact, should payments be the foundation of greater financial ecosystems around services and products? And that's a place where governments can have a wonderful public debate and encourage change. Should and payments that, be free? And that debate is, is, uh, is happening. I think um, if you want innovation in payments, and particularly if you want people investing in security, and I think we all do, uh, people have to, my own view is people need to earn a fair return. But that's a, that is a great debate to have. Coming back to the security question, I think um, historically digital payments or e-commerce has been, at least um, uh, in some respects, a relatively high risk uh, area. Um, I think all economic actors, all private actors today are certainly investing substantially in new solutions to make the whole space more secure. And um, that's something that must be successful given the expected growth in, digital, uh, in, in the digital economy. Um, there is, in addition, let me, let me put that, in addition to the debate about free or, or not, I think we, begin, we need to begin to have a debate both here in ESEAN and then around the world on um, how we will secure this future digital economy. Um, the reality is with the Internet of Things, 
Uh, we have extraordinary opportunities and also extraordinary risks in terms of very serious new points of weakness coming into the system. If we're going to create a digital economy where small businesses around the world are, are, are major actors, uh, they are points of weakness, uh, potential points of weakness on issues like cyber and so on. So, so there needs to be a wider conversation about these issues um, uh, that transcends national boundaries. We need more uh, international standards on, on, on these issues. And they are coming down the, the, the road at us very, very quickly. I, I cannot manage another password in my life. Perhaps, perhaps you can. Um, we need a better solution to identify consumers to devices. And this is coming at us very quickly. And the work needs to begin now. Global solution. And how about you, Dr. Chenning? Do you think payments should be free? Or do you think how to break down the barriers between uh, the, the markets? You see, the, yeah, the barriers, if we need to remove the barriers so that the, we can, so that the payment can be done more like uh, have more particip more participation yeah, from from the consumer but uh, again we talk about the the, the regulation is the key you know? and we talk about the uh, KYC we talk the, about the end time money laundering but we can we can uh, talk about the let's put it the, at the minimum which at, at what level that we we can say yes yes okay it can go, get through and how, how big amount we are talking about that it uh, can be like a question need to be asked under the certain regulation. Yeah, so again, we should like uh, allow a risk at certain level. We talk about at what amount that uh, we can let it through and, and what, it, uh, what amount that we can, uh, we can ask a lot of question in that. So, so I think uh, remove that. But we cannot say no. We should not have such a, such a regulation. No, we must. We should have, but uh, at certain level, yeah, to make it uh, to ease uh, payment. Yeah. But most of the, uh, we, since we talk uh, about the uh, digital one, so those uh, question uh, should like a sell sell uh, declaration uh, provide uh, by the uh, uh, digital. La, I mean, digital in, information provide. No? So, but again, I, like, I just want to highlight that we need to compromise certain what level that we that we can let let it get through, and what level we should uh, like strictly uh, require certain information before it can get through. So, yeah, this is. Uh, my uh, comment to that. Yeah. Belishan, if I may add, I think you know it, it's a wonderful debate to have, and like every good debate, there are thoughtful views on both sides. And like every debate, where you stand on the issue depends on where you sit. Mm -hmm. And if your business is in the business of providing payments, mm -hmm. perhaps you'll have a different perspective than if you're largely in the business of receiving payments and paying that cost. But what I would observe is that in the 1990s, every telco in the world was rather, uh, rather anxious about the fact that the price per gigabit per second seemed to be falling by 30% a year, almost to the point where telecoms bandwidth became free. And yet, the telecoms business has never been stronger on a global basis. The reduction in cost has led to such an expansion in payment, in, 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 in data volumes. And our dream is that if payments become incrementally less expensive every year, a little bit more convenient, a little bit more secure every year, that creates an elasticity of demand, which makes the world even more prosperous. But how does that be? Commercially sustainable. Come again. How does that? Uh, how 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 does companies uh, operating that uh, last? How how is that commercially sustainable? Well, I think it's all about operating cost. The beauty of Silicon Valley is that it takes something that someone's done before and makes it ten times cheaper. It's sort of Moore's law for chips. Could we create a Moore's law for payments? Is something we think a lot, awful lot about, and it all gets to the heart of what are your variable costs? What are the variable costs in the payment world? Whether it be risk or fraud or security or this or that. And if we can chip away at that process to the point where it becomes basis points, not percentage points, that's a fascinating world to live in. Exciting. And Raul, and, uh, let's come back to the regulation for a second. So what do you think would be uh, the, the regulators should do and shouldn't do? <clears throat> I think we clo work closely with most regulators, uh, mm -hmm. as most people on this panel. And uh, regulations are important. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to protect the consumer. You need to protect the business. Uh, I think what's a few things which uh, you know, we are always trying to uh, evangelize and it's part of our, our narrative is, uh, first of all, KYC needs to be made simpler. 
Uh, it doesn't necessarily need to be the old paradigm of a wet signature. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of new technology there. There's internal data, external data, video calling. Uh, you know, one example I have is uh, this company in uh, Philippines, uh, uh, Paymaya. And you know, they pioneered this KYC mechanism that you can do a voice video call on Facebook and essentially show your ID over video. And that's considered very strong KYC, and uh, they're piloting it now. So innovation like this, I think we need to have an open mind of uh, how can we verify the customer and, and underwrite the customer. That's kind of one thing which is uh, uh, which which I hope uh, regulators will uh, will take into consideration. The other two is a little bit about uh, you know protectionism, uh, and I was very encouraged last two days hearing this uh, whole narrative around uh, anti-protectionism, anti globalization, et cetera. And there are two aspects to this, uh, which uh, worries most global companies, is the local ownership. Uh, and uh, so I think global companies have a certain way in they operate, they have global infrastructure. So it's very, very difficult to create uh, islands of uh, local ownership. And the second is local, local data center. It's a, you know, most data is moving to cloud now. And uh, if some countries are insisting that you know data needs to be locally stored in a data, that's kind of it's just form over substance in my opinion, because data anyway is in the cloud, uh, fully protected, and you need to worry more about the security of the data than where it is physically located. That is to me is meaningless. So those are the two or three things which I think we are we're trying to appeal. Uh, otherwise, I think uh, regulators are very progressive. Uh, most countries they've made tremendous progress in their thinking, in the way they have drafted regulations, in the in the way they are. Facilitating, and I think what's more encouraging, Singapore, Thailand, uh, they don't necessarily just see themselves as regulator. Now they are seeing themselves as facilitators. They're creating regulatory sandboxes. They're encouraging people to join the ecosystem. So great progress has been made there. Uh, my, my, my hope and appeal is only on those two aspects of local data center and local ownership. <laughs> Fascinating. Um, so regulators, as not just the facilitator, as the first user, as the protect, as the protection of the consumers, and also creating the level playing field. So we have time to take probably uh, two questions from the audience, and uh, if you can raise your hand, and also I'll introduce yourself a little bit, and also if you ask the question, and tell us which panelist you hope to answer your question. Here's a gentleman over there. Hi. Thank you. Uh, I work for a mobile operator group, and I totally agree with all the views, except for the last comment, sir. I think in terms of the regulatory people, uh, the regulators, I think we will, I think we need to do a lot more work in trying to convince them to relax the rules. Uh, in fact, for example, in Cambodia, non-banks are not allowed to hold a uh, financial service license. Quite simple as that. Cloud computing, cloud infrastructure, very, very, uh, very scared about that. And how do we convince them? My question is, all the arguments are made, we heard it time and time again, how do we get the central bankers, the FS authorities to sit down together perhaps and come, to get, come up with, convince them, right? Because uh, we need them to move. Otherwise, you just can talk and talk and talk. And that's it. How do we get them to talk together? And you want to ask? My question is, how do we convince them? How do we advocate? You want to ask which panelist? Uh, anybody, yes. Anybody. Yeah. Maybe Dr. Incheni, yeah, you can speak that, yeah. from the yeah. shoes of the central bank. Yeah, yeah so, so thank you very much for asking a very good question. So you see, uh, in Cambodia, like other countries also, uh, be, before we talk, when we talk about like uh, transfer, payment, this transaction done by bank, done by uh, licensed microfinance institution. But the trend now changed because the telco start to involve yeah, start to involve in this. I, I remember well during the last uh, last uh, web uh, we discussed on that. The, we worried that uh, in the future the telco will play the role like a bank and financial institution. But but this is not. But it's it's a good move. It's a good move. No? The thing is uh, the the clarification. I mean the absence of uh, clear regulation. I think this is the key point. If I think, can we sit with the regulator? Yes, I think, sit with the uh, regulator who is the regulator, the National Bank of Cambodia in our case. Cambodia, sit with the regulator and have the regulation in place so clarify what, what the telco can do, what the bank and financial institution can do, and what is the absence in the existing regulation. Because the ex existing regulation, they say that each telco company, if you want to provide money transfer services, you need to find, they call third party processor. 
So this is the, to me, address in the third party processor. What is the role of the third party processor? What is the role of the telco? Can I become the third party processor? Because the, the question also about the third party processor in the regulation, if you, you, be, you choose one partner telco already, uh, can I choose the other partner? So this is the gray part also we need. If we improve the regulation, like uh, if you apply as a third party processor, you can be partner with so many telco, com telco company. I think it's, it, it's not the, it's not the, like a barrier, it's not the regulation not allow the telco to do as a, act as a money transfer company, but it's a clarification in terms of regulation. It's already existed, but it's, it's not, uh, it's, it doesn't state clearly. If the regulation said, yes, as a telco, you can do, and as a third party processor, you can work with many telco, and then it's done. So is it difficult to work with them? I don't think they will, uh, uh, they will uh, decline for, for meeting. I think if uh, put the effort together of the three party, include the bank, financial institution, the telco, and then the, national, the central bank and National Bank of Cambodia, and all the third party processor, and then put clarify on the regulation, I think this uh, we can do yeah, in Cambodia case, I think. I think there's also an opportunity, if I could add, to, to point to other parts of the world where more liberal licensing has produced great outcomes. So the e-money license regime in Europe has been in place for a long time and has been very successful in driving more innovation in that space. So that's part of the answer, too, is, is pointing to other examples that have worked productively in addition to the kind of capacity building, I think, that uh, Dr. Chani is talking, or the capacity deep conversation on the details that the, Dr. Chani is discussing. I think, though, we should be mindful, to, to your question, sir, of the fundamental reality, the political reality of much of Southeast Asia, which is that there are long-held beliefs or, and power structures that support oligopolies and in industries. And in many ways, regulation is one part John Stuart Mill, what's the best for the best number of people, and one part a reflection of local lobbying. And it wouldn't be too far a stretch to say that in certain countries in this region, certain established sources of, of value, certain established uh, players in the market, are quite keen not to have an atomization of their industry, not to have 25 flowers bloom where today there are two or three. So there has to be a little bit of a mind shift and perhaps even a sense of public good creation by regulators to say, yes, we are both respondees to lobbying, but also caretakers of, of the John Stuart Mill view of the social, the social benefit. Thank you, fantastic. Now we can take a, one more yeah, question I'll, I'll, from I'll, oh. behind you. Yes, this, this lady. Um, I run a company providing business, uh, pro providing work jobs to blue collar foreign workers in Japan. Okay, uh, we are the third largest economy in Japan. But if you look at these people, they are in bank. They don't have credit card, and their objective is to bring money to their home countries. But they struggle for remittance, of course, the high cost, the exchange rate. So I would like to ask Nick, what will happen? You talked about. You know, benefiting the people who are in bank. Well, what will happen to this global limitance with your company, a new business like you will be in as a player? It's such a wonderful question. And I think, frankly, if I can be so direct, and uh, forgive me if I hurt someone's feeling in the audience, the cost of remittance is, I think, one of the great tragedies in this world. When I say that Southeast Asia and Asia more broadly is one of the most expensive places to be poor, what comes to mind is that 200 long line in Lucky Plaza in Singapore, where incredibly hard working people torn away from their families, are in line for two hours simply to send a little bit of money back to mom and dad uh, to, or to provide for their children back home. So we dream of a world, and it's coming quite close, where the variable costs associated with money transfer country to country, again subject to security, KYC, and whatnot are to a point where the most disadvantaged members of society can treat this as a simple basic good in their lives. Because what we care more about is not whether someone makes the margin on sending money back to Makati or back to Quezon City. We care much more about how that money is spent when it's brought back home. So we share your view, ma'am, and, and I applaud you for raising this as an issue. Okay, uh, it's a fascinating talk. I would love to continue the conversation by running short of time. Before we close, I would, like, I would love to have every single one of our panelists to uh, use one sentence to summarize. Uh, what's your major takeaway from the conversation? Let's probably start from Roland. 
I think one takeaway is that no one company can do this on its own. You know, it's we need to partner. Uh, the global companies need to partner with local companies. The global companies themselves need to partner more closely as we are doing now. Um, and I think it needs to be a partnership approach. This it's an ecosystem play. Payments, financial inclusion, displacing cash. Uh, there's multiple constituents. There's merchants. There's consumers. There's the ecosystem payment security. So no one company can do it. Uh, the private sector, public sector, government has to come together to do it. And I think the tremendous progress has been made uh, in the last two to three years, and I'm very hopeful, uh, very, remain very optimistic about you know, what's in future in the next five years. Partnership, so. Yeah, thank you, I, I share with uh, Rahul also. Mm -hmm. But in addition to that, I, I see that uh, the inclusion of the, I mean, all segment, uh, because uh, when we talk about the, the payment, the payment experience or the payment so far, most of it are, like uh, touch on the, uh, middle class, I mean the low segment, those who sell fish, sell vegetable in the market, I mean um, uh, motorbike transportation, tuk-tuk, uh, you know, like in Cambodia case, those are most of the time it's uh, excluded from that uh, payment, uh, so payment solution. So if we have the payment solution whereby they can have, I mean, access in the access to that, it will, uh, it will uh, make the make the digital payment, it make uh, the subject we just uh, discussed about, like uh, this stolen cash as a king. No? But to me, again, I want to highlight again, I like to see this is as one of the payment solution, the payment of choice where they can choose. No? But uh, in, include those uh, low income, include those uh, like uh, difficult having access to financial services before by means of uh, digital payment. Yeah. So turning exclusion to inclusion, Inclu using inclusion. cash or whatever resource we have. Um, this is an and. Uh, the, the, the answer to this question involves and, not or. Uh, to your point, it requires a variety of players to be engaged. It requires a laser focus on great use cases that solve actual needs for consumers and small businesses. Um, Government has an essential role to play in driving uh, the solutions across all these markets, uh, both as a regulator and as an actor. Um, and we need to be thinking and investing now about the security of the future payment system uh, because the digital world we seek uh, to live in uh, is one that will require further investments from where we are today to what we want to achieve in terms of a safe and secure future. And that work needs to be done. Thank you. And Nick? You have I the think, last word. I, I think the, uh, our, our observation is one of tremendous optimism for the future. Southeast Asia has roughly twice as many people as the United States, but one-sixth the GDP, which means that there's an 11x ahead of us. That's an extraordinarily special future to build towards. And I think all of us in this room have a deep responsibility and I think a tremendous motivation to want to make that future happen as quickly as possible. Thank you. And uh, we'll end at a very positive note. And thank you very much for participating in this wonderful debate. And I certainly learned a lot. I hope the audience uh, joined me as well to thank our panelists for this insight. Thank you.